Update on vicious and dangerous dog issues by retired officer John Denny. John Denny, retired SFPD and current hearing officer for the Vicious and Dangerous Dog Court, will update the commission on aggressive dog issues in San Francisco. Good evening, commissioners. And before I start, I've, I want to make sure that you each have they're worth their weight in gold at Kinko's to pass out. Okay. Uh, that's kind of the study guide that goes with the lectures. So I, I know it's, it's a lot of reading, but uh, there's a lot of interesting reading in there. And uh, Excuse yeah. me, Mr. Denny, may I interrupt? I just want to point to our commissioners. Um, you have the screens in front of you. If you turn them on, we have the same presentation there on your um, personal screen. Sorry, oh, go ahead. All right. well, well, we, may, we may not use it. It, it, it depends. But uh, again, for those of you that don't know me, my name is John Denny. I'm a hearing officer for San Francisco's Vicious and Dangerous Dog Court. But tonight, I appear before you simply as a concerned citizen. Any documents, pictures, or videos I share with you tonight were attained via through the Sunshine Ordinance request or given to me by other concerned citizens. That is to say that nothing that I'm going to show you tonight was pulled from the confidential files of any of the vicious and dangerous documents that I've ever seen. I wanted to make that uh, up front. I come uh, before you tonight to request your assistance to establish independent public oversight of the San Francisco Department of Animal Care and Control. Just wanted to let that sink in. Animal Care and Control is the only law enforcement entity in the city currently without independent oversight. All right? So that, that's, that's what I'm going to be trying to schmooze you into tonight. So that's a, so, so I just, uh, just let, you, uh, let you be warned. Now I'm just going to take two minutes and tell you who I am. And uh, for those of you who don't know me, I served 29 years in the San Francisco Police Department until my retirement in 2014. In 2001, I became the investigator of all reports of aggressive dog behavior and reviewed thousands of dog bites and, when necessary, prepared cases to be put before the vicious dog hearing officer. In 2010, I was appointed by then San Francisco Police Chief George Gascon as hearing officer for a vicious and dangerous dog court hearing. So basically, I went from the investigator of all uh, vicious dog uh, reports to the hearing officer. All right? I've been an invited speaker as a content expert regarding aggressive dog issues at the UC Davis Veterinary School of Behavioral Science, Guide Dogs for the Blind, various California State Humane Conventions, and last year I was invited to give a speech in Tokyo regarding their uh, fledgling SBCA and how uh, they would be able to organize and address aggressive dog issues in Tokyo. All right, so. Um, in all humility, I, I've been at this for 23 years, and I, I just just want to establish my uh, uh, credentials. And again, I say that with all humility because there are a lot of mistakes, a lot of starts and stops, but I, I think we, we got it right. Uh, I want to show you a real quick story about how I got involved in the Vicious and Neighbors Dog Unit. Back in 1993, I was working with a guy named Sergeant Bill Herndon out at Petrero Station. Uh, in, in Hunter's Point, and the captain got promoted to commander, and he took us with him to be his uh, staff. Well, one of his new uh, uh, responsibilities was he had the vicious and dangerous hearing officer, who was a police officer, under his command. That person retired uh, suddenly. Uh, he just said, I'm not coming to work today. And Sergeant Herndon and I were sitting out in front at our desks. The commander stuck his head out and says, OK, Herndon, you and Denny, you're going. You're the vicious dog guys. Good luck. I had no idea what was what it was about. No, no idea uh, what was coming down the pipe. So we ended up down here at the health department at the auditorium, and Sergeant Herndon sat pretty much in the hot seat, very sitting out, uh, Commissioner, <coughs> and I sat in the back because I guess I was the bailiff. And the issue was that this gentleman's three Rottweiler dogs had gotten out in the neighborhood and just caused absolute bedlam, chasing people on top of the cars, under the cars. It was a real, real, real Donnybrook. Animal Care and Control came and took the dogs, took them in custody, thus we had the hearing. So the dog owner came in, told Sergeant Ernan, burglars broke the dogs out, that's how they got out, and I want my dogs back. 
Well, Sergeant Mernon says, well, I've got a few days to make my decision, I'll let you know. The dog owner wasn't happy with that. And that night, the dog owner went to animal care control, uh, and I even remember the dog's names. The three dogs was Hum Daddy 1, Hum Daddy 2, and Hum Daddy 3. That night, the dog owner took Hum Daddy number 4, another Rottweiler, to animal care and control after they closed, rang the emergency bell, and said, I want to turn in Hum Daddy 4, he's vicious and dangerous too. And so the night attendant opened the door, the dog owner simulated a gun, took the kennel attendant, walked him into a kennel in the back of the building, and then broke his dogs off and took him home and went straight home. <clears throat> the kennel attendant broke out of the kennel, called the police, and the police said, and this was 1993, said, don't worry about it, it's just a dog issue. And they wouldn't respond. The director of animal care and control, uh, Carl Friedman at the time, he called Sergeant Hurden and said, what do you mean you're not going to respond? The sergeant called the lieutenant admission station. They went out and arrested the guy. And then he actually did some prison time because that wasn't his first brush with the law. But that was our first <laughs> exposure to the vicious and dangerous dog process. And we were both thinking, what have we gotten into? And one of the reasons I want to bring that up because all during the, the 90s, <clears throat> up to and uh, uh, until 2001, uh, if you're playing catch with your son or daughter at the park and a dog comes up and bites and you call the police, the police would come in and say, ah, it's a civil matter. Don't worry about it. Forget about it. And that's if you could get the 911 dispatcher to send somebody. 911 dispatcher would say, oh, call animal care and control. So you, you've got a bleeding child at the park. They call, uh, you call 911, they say, oh no, call animal care and control. Well, animal care and control would say, well, we don't handle dog bites, call the police. And they would be bounced back and forth. And it was just a mess. And nobody was taking police reports, nobody was taking action on it. Then, on January 26, 2001, something horrific happened. A woman named Diane Whipple was mauled to death by two pressing canary of dogs. Now, we had the vicious and dangerous dog hearing on the second dog. One of the dogs was put down that night. The second dog, the owners were arguing, had nothing to do with the, uh, the woman's death. Um, the homicide inspectors for San Francisco police took the case over, and they discovered 66 cases, 66 people who had witnessed incidents of those dogs acting in a menacing and be, uh, aggressive behavior. But nobody made a report. And even if they had made a report, no one would have taken the report. And Sergeant Hernine found that appalling. We found that dreadfully appalling. So um, prior to Diane Wilco being called, the police department did nothing. Afterwards, uh, Sergeant Hernine and I got together, and we made some of the changes that I'm just going to uh, outline for you. We established uh, and founded the Vicious and Dangerous Dog Unit of the San Francisco Police Department. And what we decided to do, well, I did most of the work. He was the hearing officer. I have to give you that no confidence. But uh, I collected every dog bite report that was made to the police department through animal care and control, through the hospitals, the doctor's offices, what have you, put them all together, reviewed them, made sure they got put into the animal care and control database. And then the cases that needed to go to vicious and dangerous dog court, I put a, a case file together, and then we would deal with it. Now, what we decided to do was it's not enough just to wait for somebody to bite before you request a vicious and dangerous dog hearing. Diane Whipple taught us that just menacing and aggressive behavior, because some of the incidents with Diane Whipple were the mailman would be in the lobby of the building where this occurred, and the two dogs corner him, and, and the mailman would use his cart to keep the dogs at bay. Well, no police officer is going to take a report on that prior to an animal being involved to death. No, nope, nobody. Um, another incident happened where uh, in the uh, lobby, the elevator, someone was getting in. One of the dogs nipped, didn't uh, uh, break any skin, but uh, no report was made. Nothing was done about it. So Sergeant Herndon and I decided that we want to know all the incidents of menacing and aggressive behavior. We went to the uh, uh, police academies, we went to the in-service training, and we told the officers, we want you to take not only dog bite reports, but near misses, or if they get the clothing, or if they chase you down the street. We want to know about that because somebody's going to get a phone call. These reports will be uh, 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 reviewed. 
And that's pretty much what happened. And we got Animal Care and Control on board. Uh, Carl Friedman, the director, said, hey, you two, I'd love to have two uniformed officers in the, in the Animal Care and Control building. Gave us a desk, a car, uh, phones, a computer, everything the police department wouldn't give us, and so we moved in there. And uh, one of the advantages was that the, uh, uh, our, our office was right next to their emergency dispatch line, so when they got a hot call, I could just jump in the van with the animal care control officer, and we'd be off to the races, because one of the problems animal care control officers had when they showed up to police incidents, that, that uh, the police would treat them poorly. And I was kind of the guy to educate the police. I said, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. These, we've all got to get along here. So there was a hand-in-glove relationship with uh, animal care control and the police. There was no reason for an MOU. Things were going swimmingly. Right? It was just, it was better than sliced bread. Uh, we would get calls from all over the country for people, uh, other municipalities, asking, well, how are you guys doing it? How do you get along with it? And we told them how we set it up. It was all common sense. There was, there was no genius to this. But uh, it, it still seemed to be a, a mystery of, for the municipalities. Uh, the reason I'm here before you tonight is things aren't that way anymore. All right? Now, the reason I gave you my background and my history is I, I just hope to impress you that uh, I do know what I'm talking about. And I, I, I've worked uh, 25 years getting it to where it was just, like I said, better than sliced bread. Well, that's not the case anymore. Uh, there's a new administration at Animal Care Control, and things just aren't going well. Things could be done better. It seems to be kind of a poor fit. I'm, I'm terribly concerned in the sense that uh, the, 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 the bites, uh, Bites that don't break the skin are not considered dog bites in San Francisco anymore. Animal Care Control doesn't consider those dog bites. So I, I can show you pictures of, of bruises and hematomas, but that isn't considered. Someone will call up Animal Care Control and say, hey, I got bit by a dog. And they say, well, did it break the skin? So it's, well, well, no, but I got a hell of a bruise. Says, well, that's not really a dog bite. We don't count that. Uh, dog bites that occurred in uh, veterinary hospitals, training facilities, grooming parlors, Wherever the dog bites occur in San Francisco, according to the health code, which is what we follow, they should be reported. Animal Care and Control says no, we do not respond to or uh, record bites that happen if it's uh, a grooming or, or, or uh, and I understand the vet tech is giving a, a schnauzer a, a rabies vaccine, the dog turns around and bites him. I still think it's important to have that on record somewhere, but that doesn't mean a police officer is going to call and say, we're taking it a vicious dog for it. But it needs to be reviewed. So that's, uh, there's, there, there's a few other things that are, are, are tremendously uh, concerning to me, and I, and I don't really want to go into them, but the fact that I gave you all, um, I, I, it really goes into tremendous detail, and it's very disturbing. And, uh, uh, one of my pet peeves. Now, the reason we're talking about all this is because I believe that animal care and control needs oversight. Okay, the animal care and control doesn't okay doesn't count uh, dog bites don't break the skin, but animal care and control also doesn't believe they need to have staff the unit uh, between midnight and six o'clock in the morning. Now, recently. We had an incident you may have heard, heard about in the paper happened over in the Safeway near Golden Gate Park. Uh, one of my charges, uh, uh, a guy uh, came before me at Vicious and Dangerous Dog Court. Uh, I had to deem this dog vicious and dangerous. Uh, a few weeks later, he walks into Safeway after midnight, uh, gets involved with a security encounter. The security guard challenges him. The dog bites the security guard. They get in a fight. The dog owner stabs the security officer. The cops come, take the dog owner to jail, but they're left with the dog. Well, the police call animal care and control and says, hey, we got a dog here, you bit somebody, would you pick it up? No answer to the phone. No recording. No, no, uh, no contingency plan on what to do. The cops are stuck with this dog. So what they ended up doing was they put this dog they know nothing about, because there's no one to call to find out about this dog, 
They put the dog in the back of the police car. They took it up to Pets Unlimited and said, hey, could you hold on to the dog until someone comes to work at Animal Care and Control at 6 o'clock in the morning? And uh, 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 Pets Unlimited, I think it's the SPCA now, whoever it was, said, well, we don't, uh, we don't have a contract with the city. We, we shouldn't be doing this. And uh, they fired the police and said, well, we've got nothing else to do with this stuff. So they took the dog in. Well, the real kicker to this is that dog was, de was deemed vicious and dangerous. That's a vicious and dangerous dog. So the cops didn't know it. They're handling it like another dog. They took it to a private uh, boarding facility, handed it to him, and said, here you go. Would you watch it for us a little while? They had no idea this dog was vicious and dangerous. Can you imagine the liability? But uh, what, what's mind-boggling to me is after uh, Director uh, uh, Katz left, she had requisitioned five more additional animal care control officers so they could resume staffing the midnight shift. But even under Rebecca uh, Katz's watch, there was somebody there who was going to pick up the phone, the mobile phone, get out of bed, and, and respond. Okay? That's not the case right now. So uh, when the new administration took over, they inherited five extra animal care and control officers. They were told, well, now you can staff midnights. But I spoke to one of the animal care control officers who told me that, well, no one wants to work midnight, so we'll just leave it at that. And that's the current policy right now. That, that to me, now, that, that, that to me is very disturbing. Uh, I'm not going to get into the MOU with the police department. I'm not going to get into, uh, well, there's, there's all kinds of things. And it's in your, it's in your packet. Uh, this isn't a, I know what you can and can't do. I, 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 I was a member of the commission for many years myself, all right? And I realized that you're an advisory body to the Board of Supervisors. And you can't run down the hall to the Board of Supervisors and tell the Board of Supervisors to teach animal care and control what constitutes a dog bite, or to order animal care and control to be available 24-7 or to hire somebody capable of supervising a law enforcement agency. Animal Care and Control has nobody in supervisorial power right now that has had any experience managing a law enforcement agency. There are a dozen public safety officers with the powers of arrest, have handcuffs, pepper spray, batons, taught to use them, but they have no oversight and they have nobody supervising them that has any experience in, in the field. Um, I know you can't run down the hall and ask the Board of Supervisors to demand that ACC reports incidents of aggressive dog behavior wherever it occurs and that such incidents be forwarded to the San Francisco Police Department for reviewing possible action. I, I know you can't run down the hall and demand that the supervisors uh, ask animal care and control to undo the damage they've done and restore the credibility and impartiality of the vicious and dangerous dog hearing process, which is nothing more than a kangaroo court right now, unfortunately. Um, so here's what I know you can do, and that, that's what I'm going to ask. And I, in, in the back of my packet, it says part three remedies, and I have five different things that I was asking, but then uh, it, it dawned on me that not to waste your time with things that you can't do. So here's what I'm asking you all to do, is to inform the Board of Supervisors that there is a real and urgent need for independent oversight and transparency for the San Francisco Department of Animal Care and Control. Such oversight could be in the form of additional oversight responsibilities given to the existing Commissional of Animal Control and Welfare. So how about it? You up for it? All right. I'd be thinking about it, too. All right, this is, this is what, now remember, the police department has the police commission, the health department has the health commission, the fire department has the fire commission, animal care and control has officers running around with the powers of arrest and nobody can go over them. So, uh, here, and also, for you to inform the board, board of supervisors that animal care and control management has demonstrated that it neither has the training, experience, nor inclination to adequately supervise a public safety unit, and therefore a full and independent public safety audit is urgently needed regarding the operation of San Francisco Animal Care and Control's Field Services Unit. 
So that, that's, this, is, this is all about protecting public safety. We're not open. If a dog gets hit by a car on Sloan Avenue, it's going to die in the gutter. All right? That comes under animal care and control. Okay? That, that comes under your, your, your uh, 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 auspices. And I don't think it's really asking so much that we could get some oversight. Because who do you complain to? Who do you complain to that animal care and control isn't open from 12 to 6? You can call the city administrator. Not. <laughs> Actually, don't call the city administrator. I did that, and that, I, <laughs> nothing but trouble. Nothing but trouble. That's a story for another time. But there, there are people that have suffered tremendous injustice at the hands of animal care and control. They call the mayor's office. The mayor calls animal care and control and says, hey, they say you're not doing your job. He says, well, we'll get right on it. Then a week later, they call the mayor and says, well, they were wrong. We, we, we're doing everything we need to do. It's like, oh, well, good work. You can keep it up. You call the board of supervisors. They call animal care and control and says, hey, we got a complaint that you did this and this and this. So we'll, we'll, we'll look into it. They're looking into themselves. There, there's, there's no independent public oversight for this. And uh, uh, you, you'll read in the packet, there, there's, some, there's some very, uh, um, well, it, 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 it's deeply, deeply troubling. All right, there was uh, uh, one, one more quick story out of Casita Park. There was a dog that I had in order to destroy. Uh, seizure order went out for it in May of 2017. Uh, we knew where the dog owner lived. The dog was there. Uh, animal care control refused to go pick up the dog. The dog had attacked two more dogs even after the seizure order had been. I'd uh, spoken with one of the uh, uh, field services supervisors and they said, oh, well, we don't have time to do that. Well, finally, the people at Presidio Park were so upset, they got Channel 4 News to do a, a story on it. And the day after the story aired on Ch in October, the very next day the dog was impounded. But who do you complain to? Fifty people signed a petition to the city administrator saying, "Hey, the person that you, your your uh, agency that you control didn't do their job." Nobody got a response uh, from the city administrator's office. So there's a uh, there's all there. I, I really don't want to go into splitting hairs here. I didn't want to have a bloodbath. But what I'm telling you is that when I was in Japan, and I was, tell, I was bragging about how we just have it smoking good over here, and everybody's cooperating, and hand in glove, and the police department, animal care and control, we're just like, you know, hand in glove, and everything's, um, I can't say that anymore. As a matter of fact, we are less prepared for dog attack now than we were before Diane Whipple. Right? Just want that to sink in a little bit. We are less prepared. We are doing less than what we were doing before Diane Whipple was mauled to death. That's why we need some kind of forum which you can request through the Board of Supervisors, say whether it's a commission like the police commission, whether it's a charter amendment, or whether they give you all the uh, uh, the powers to have the pub to oversee what's going on there, uh, something has to be done. It just can't, it's, it, just, it just breaks my heart. Now, I know I've left a million things out. Um, and uh, I, I know if I speak too long, the eyes start glazing out. I've got gory pictures and uh, this and that, and I, I'm not gonna show you today. I don't wanna start with like that. Because I, I know that what you can and can't do, but what you can do is approach the Board of Supervisors and have somebody put together legislation that holds animal care and control accountable to the public for what they're doing, okay? So I'll just open it to any questions. You probably don't have many because you haven't read my packet yet, but uh, I'm sure you'd have a lot of questions after you read my packet. Anybody got any questions? As a matter of fact, okay. Um, and I did have time to review your packet. Oh, I have two questions. Some. Um, number one, it's a little unclear to me. Um, Okay, so for example, on page four, number three, it is Ms. Donahue's new policy. For the record, Ms. Donahue is the director of animal care and control. Right. It is her new policy. How do you, um, how do we know what the policy is? Is it is it publicly written? Is this, um, I know you've talked to a lot of people. Is this based on your discussions with people, or in other words, if and when there's a policy change, how is it um, disseminated to the public? Well, that's the rub. There are no written policies over animal care and control. 
whatever comes out of anybody's mouth there is the written policy. Okay? There is no written policy. Uh, uh, Ms. Dunning has stood here and told me uh, they had an attack at their kennel. Uh, a kennel attendant was attacked, taken to the hospital. And I said, oh, well, there's going to be a vicious and dangerous dog here on that. She says, oh, no, we don't count attacks to happen in vet hospitals or if, uh, uh, as counting. And I said, well, where did you hear that? And she says, well, that's just our policy. And I said, well, do you think that's a wise policy? I know where she got it. It's, it comes from a code that has nothing to do with our health code. Okay, but I said, so where is it written down? Well, it's in the food and ag code under, uh, uh, under a different hearing process that we don't use, but somehow she's adopted that and it's not written down. There are no written policies. The field services officers that are running around in the vans, they have no written directives. They don't have a written directive when to impound a dog. How old the dog, uh, if a dog bites a child under five years old, do we impound that dog? There are no written directives for anything. They, they weigh in as they go. Okay. So when it says it is the new policy, it's not, then it's not the new policy. In fact, there's just not, what you're saying is there's really not a policy? Whatever she says is policy is policy. And she looked me in the eye right here, and I'm standing right there, and she says, that's the policy of animal care and control. And I asked her, where is it written? And she gave me a look that I've seen many, many times. But uh, we've had some run-ins, obviously. Obviously, obviously. I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, thank you for that. And then the second question I have, um, I, I understand the model um, that you explained of the police commission oversight. And, but in your research, have you found any jurisdictions that do a better job of this than us? Or do, is there any area or any place, a city, that, that you would model ours on other than just different agencies? Well, a lot of agencies let their Animal Care and Control Division run their uh, Public Safety Division, the Animal Care and Control Officers. And that worked until the new administration took over. It doesn't work anymore. What needs to happen, actually, is the public safety units, the officers with the powers of arrest, who are in charge of uh, prosecuting felony uh, arrests in cases of running it through the DA's office, which nobody there knows how to do, should be absorbed by the police department. Because the fact is, the police are the first responders to every dog line. All right? So people say, oh, no, we don't want the cops to get involved. No, I'm not talking about getting the cops involved with the shelter. All right? I want the police officers to be able to support and supervise the public safety officers that enforce the animal control laws in San Francisco. That, that's a no-brainer. And there's a lot of communities that, that do that. Now, we, we have to separate. Uh, uh, there's a lot of blowback for the police getting involved in the shelter activities, and I get you, I get you. But right, so the animal care control officers would then be answering to the police commission if they do any, if someone has a complaint, or um, if they need help, if they need an, an arrest warrant, or if they need a, a, a search warrant, or, or they need help uh, with interview techniques or, or, or anything like that. So yeah, the, the model here, um, since the last, since Rebecca Katz left, there has been nobody there, the director, the deputy director, the operations manager, and the acting captain, that have any experience in public safety. And yet, they're running a division with a dozen public safety officers. Good questions, though. Good questions, though. Um, other commissioners, I imagine, does anyone have questions for Mr. Denny? Okay. Well, I'll be available. I do actually yes. have one question, and this is probably just because I know there's this process, this other process, maybe the other commissioners don't know about, but the ACC is under a grand jury uh, normal like process of investigation. So how, um, for, in what way do they look at the public safety piece of how ACC operates um, uh, as a grand jury, which is a public Commission or public oversight, how do they evaluate that piece of it? I'm just curious. I, I don't really know how it works. I know it happens, and, and I don't know how often the review periods happen, but I'm just curious what they do. I signed a letter of confidentiality with the grand jury saying that I cannot comment on any of those topics publicly. 
Okay, so I, I can't, uh, Anna. I, I can't even verify, uh, the, uh, 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 corroborate your uh, assertion or your assumption that uh, the uh, grand jury is looking into animal care control right now. Finds the word for me. Okay. All right. Um, now, on a peripheral, if, if you can reword it so that I'm not talking about how the grand past, jury. Oh. There have been public oversight reviews of animal care and control. Did I'm not aware of any. Okay. I'm not aware of one. Animal care and control has never had a public safety audit. Okay. I mean, as part of um, other formalized review processes, which we won't name, there have been these past reviews. Um, no. What's the depth? No, no. It's animal care and control, their emergency dispatch line, it's not even recorded. These people are not trained properly. They don't know how to, uh, 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 it, 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 it's just a disaster. It's just a disaster. That's why I was asking for a public safety audit, so that you'd say, well, where are your written directives for your officers in the field? What happens if they come upon a, a service dog that has been mauled? Or more often than not, what if you find a service dog that has done the mauling? All right? How do you handle that? There's no written directive there. there, there there's, uh, the San Francisco Police Department has general orders, has a book, this, this big, uh, Officer Crockett, of what you shall and shall not do. Animal care control doesn't have any of that. They, they, they're just kind of winging it and hoping for the best. That's why, to the best of my knowledge, and I, I was in their office for uh, over 20 years, uh, there was never an independent study as to their efficiency or their effectiveness uh, from an outside agency, or an inside agency, for that matter. Well, they, and they've never needed it as far as I'm concerned, but the uh, last uh, couple of years, we, we've gotten to the point now where something very bad is going to happen, and we're all going to be wondering why we didn't do something. Further questions? Well, I'll tell you what. Since you guys didn't have a chance to to look at the packet. I'm just going to give you a little quick overview of some of my concerns. And uh, Officer Crockett, I hope I did this right. Uh, uh, you got it done. Oh, good. Okay, let's try this. Okay, I, I don't see that. The whole uh, thing on, on, on Dan Webble. Uh, we kind of covered that before and after. But now I'm going to show you some pictures that happened. Now, these are dog bites. The animal care control doesn't count as dog bites. All right? Now, they said, oh, well, it broke the skin. We're counting that. No, that happened through the clothing. The tooth never made contact with the person. Thus, it is not considered a dog bite. And this whole area to the left, if that's all it was, it's even more obvious. Animal care and control doesn't consider that a dog bite. So you call animal care and control and say, hey, I got bit. My, my son, my you know, grandma got bit. This is what happened. This is the problem. It's like, well, it didn't break the skin. We don't count. Let's see. Give me a couple. Eh. Now, the person who's deciding whether it's a dog bite is at the phone. Now, this is a clear example of what happens many, many times, the hematomas, all right? Mostly grandmas get this walking down the street, gets bitten through the, the, the thick bolted. That is not considered a dog bite by animal care and control. That, if reported to animal care and control, will not be forwarded to Officer Crockett so he can review the information and then determine whether we need to have something done about that. Let's see. That's, that's kind of, okay, that's definitely not a dog bite. That was caused by a dog's mouth. But, oh, and this poor guy, I, I mean, he, he's probably the happiest guy. Uh, things could have been a lot worse there, and they weren't. So that's not a dog bite either. Let me see if I set this up. Okay. Remember where I told you that um, animal care control does not look at dog attacks that happen in training facilities or boarding or anything like that? <coughs> let, me, let me show you a security camera footage of, of a, uh, an incident that happened at a dog training facility. And you tell me if this dog doesn't need a second look by the vicious and dangerous dog hearing eyes. Okay, that's the uh, trainer, that's the owner, the dogs are on bunches, hey, hey, I need you to slow down, calm down, I'm going to put my body in front, you know, calm down, hey, pooch, stop, what, oh, oh, really? No, I'm not stopping anything. Okay, now the attack begins. Okay, this guy uses a Caesar Milan thing, sometimes if you slam the dog on its side, 
that'll slow it down. That didn't work. The dog became even more enraged, went after the guy. He's got 21 stitches in his arm before they could finally uh, uh, put an end to this. Now, I thought the guy. Okay, so it's all over now. Okay, you tell me that's not an unpredictable dog. After that lesson, that dog's going to be going out into the, in, in, into the public. Now, that was shown to animal care and control, the acting captain and the acting uh, uh, lieutenant, because he came before me at a vicious and dangerous dog hearing, which had nothing to do with this. It's a whole, and I'm not even going to get into that. And I asked them, having seen that, do you think that dog is vicious and dangerous? They said, no. They said, it's provoked. So I said, I should do nothing then? He says, yeah, we feel the dog is provoked. There's nothing wrong with that dog. And I said, are you kidding me? Now, because Animal Care and Control requested the hearing and was the complainant, and they're saying the dog wasn't vicious and dangerous, the question I had was, well, why did you request a vicious and dangerous dog here in the first place, especially for a dog attack that happened in a grooming and training facility? I mean, there's a very devious answer to that, but I'm, this isn't the forum for it. But, uh, so I was able to talk to the lady, and I said, ma'am, before you leave, the, you've got a leash and muzzle your dog. Will you do that for me? And she voluntarily agreed. And as a matter of fact, Sergeant Hicks, who was the uh, uh, investigator of the vicious and dangerous dog, in, talked the dog owner into buying a house with a big backyard. So that's where the dog back ended up. So we haven't heard from that dog, that dog since. So that, that's kind of a su success story. but. Why wouldn't that be included in a dog bite scenario? Why is that not in 21 stitches? And an animal care and control says, ah, it's nothing. Well, I'm sorry. Oversight, oversight. All right, so here we go. And uh, I just had too much fun so. I talked to you about Procedure Park. Nugget Tan tonight, a dog sentenced to death at a San Francisco court has been given a second chance at life. Since then, though, the black pit bull has been reported to have hurt two more dogs. Scary disturbing to many families in the neighborhood. Front Forest Ellis Good Morning is live at Procedure Park, where dog owners are concerned she may strike again. Steve, a source tells Cronford News that that dog named Destiny has attacked yet another dog just this past week. And so park goers here for Cedar Park are just worried that this could happen again. Is that Destiny? Destiny's got quite the reputation. The adult black -like pit bull has been accused of attacking at least seven dogs. Two years ago, a San Francisco court ordered Destiny to be put down. I was uncomfortable with it, but it might have been the best option at minimum. That man should not have been allowed to own Destiny. Anymore. The death sentence was repealed and a judge gave her a second chance at life. So long she be muzzled and on a leash. But a source tells Crawford News Destiny has attacked two more dogs since then. I see it all the time. I see the look in those dogs' eyes and it's scary. It's really scary. Chris Johnson, whose own pup was attacked once before, knows how hard it can be to break up a dog fight. The dog, dog won't obey the owner. There's like gathering of people trying to pull this dog off another dog and it's just like to see that it is either breeded in them or he was trained that way. No, to frequent for Cedar Park, dog owners are worried Destiny may strike again. But don't blame the dog for her aggression. So that's not the kind of dog that I don't think should be off the leash. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the dog is bad. You know, it just needs to, I think that that dog just needs better training. I felt very uncomfortable about the idea of Destiny being put to death because I don't really feel this is her fault. Destiny's owner, Robert Washington, is described by park goers as a middle-aged, tall black man with a thin build. <laughs> Animal Control Services have had since made a fine Destiny and they're still looking for her. She has an open and active seizure order in her name. Live in San Francisco, Elsa Gamonian, Crawford News. Well, they're being very kind. Seizure order went out in May with his address on Presida Park. That's where he lives, that's where he's seen, that's where his dog attacked two other dogs since then. The people in Presida Park were so upset, and I have 50 of them here, they're, they're furious, and they, uh, they finally went to KRON, and they asked KRON to put this together.
He does animal care and control. I talked to Lieutenant uh, Amy Corso twice, and she told me, we just don't have time, and besides, we think the police should do it. <laughs> it's like, what do you mean you don't have time? It, he lives at such and such, proceed up uh, like that. The day after this was broadcast, animal care and control went out and impounded the dog. So the reason I'm showing this, who do you complain to? 50 people signed a petition to uh, 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 the city administrator said, how come we had to do this to get animal care and control to do their job? And they didn't hear boo back from it. And there's no oversight. There's, there's no commission. There's no committee. I, I, you're wonderful people, but this isn't your, in, in your power to do something about this. But it is within the Board of Supervisors to enact legislation to make it transparent. We need some transparency in animal care and control. When they drop the ball, we need to help them pick it up. Everybody is better off by that. All right? And that's, that's why I wanted to show you this, because there's nobody to complain to. I've been working for two years. I've been pounding the desk with this new administration to fix this, to fix this. And it took me a year. Hospital bike reports, women, children being sewn up at hospitals and doctors' appointments were being sent to animal care and control to be reported to the state, but were not being sent to Officer Crockett to be investigated for the vicious, uh, uh, dangerous dog overview process. And you, you don't even want to know the answer this dog he gave me because I'm not here to bash this dog here. I'm just saying that we need some oversight on this. All right? So, any questions after that? So, after you read this, you might have some questions, you might have some comments. I may be available next uh, month to come back and I'll be happy to answer some questions about uh, what your thoughts are on this, but I implore you to please go through that packet and read it. As bad as I've outlined it, I, I just want to tell you it's much, much worse. All right? I have one quick question. Yes. Too. Um, maybe not, it might not be quick, but in standard operating procedures for um, hospitals, they have to, by law, report back to dog bites to whoever the authority is, yes. is that correct? To, to, the, to, the animal, uh, to the animal control people, because then they forward it to the state for rabies control. It's all filtered it goes through that. Through that. So that, that's why the people who, who are watching their kids get sewn up at the hospital, they're, making, they're talking to a nurse and getting all the information. They think they're making a police report. They think this is going right to Officer Crockett. And, and so, well, that wasn't the case. There are at least 500 reports sitting in an envelope right next to the dispatcher's office at Animal Care and Control as we speak that are, I have never seen the light of day. Okay. All right. So there is a pile waiting there yes. to be forwarded then. So there's two avenues in which it should go. One is to the state for reporting. The other is it should go to the police department. Absolutely. Okay. And and if the uh, dispatcher at the animal care and control should be trained, it's like, oh really, you were chased down the street by a dog? They have the database. They should start that, or get the, the dog's information, get the uh, 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 the owner's information, any history, start, start a file on this. I'm sorry. I, I never, there, 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 sorry about that. Okay. So it needs to be, uh, we aren't entering all these aggressive acts down anymore. That's what we started doing after Diane Whipple, and it's not happening anymore. And it's not happening deliberately. And there needs to be some light shined on it to get us back to where we were, so at least we could have a handle on it. And that's why I'm coming to you for the oversight. And I know I'm beating you up on this, and I'm sorry, but I put 25 years of my life in this, and there's a lot of starts and stops. And, uh, uh, and, and then just to see it go all down the tubes in, in, in less, less than a year and a half, it, it, it's just, uh, it's unconscionable for me. But be that as it may, read, enjoy. Um, I, I think you my phone number through uh, Officer Crockett if you have any specific questions. And uh, I'll be happy to answer any more questions before I leave right now. Okay. Any further questions? At this point, is there any public comment? Yeah, 
Hi, um, my name is Sally Stevens, and I'm the chair of SF Dog and a former member of this commission. San Francisco Vicious Dangerous Dog Unit was groundbreaking when it was created. It's a model that's been emulated in other cities. For years, the system worked well, and the dog community was confident that the hearing officer would treat allegations against dogs with fairness and compassion, and that justice would be done. Over the years, I fought hard to protect the unit when officials wanted to close it down. The unit was always meant to be independent of outside influence, whether SFPD, the Board of Supervisors, or ACC. The reports that in recent years, ACC has interfered with the unit as rulings are troubling. The hearing officer is not a job that just anyone can do. Historically, the hearing officer relied on years of experience judging whether a dog was vicious or if there were extenuating circumstances. Now we have two inexperienced hearing officers with minimal training deciding whether a family's pet is destroyed. I have concerns about consistency in rulings made by two officers, two different people. The vision dangerous dog units independence must be protected. ACC staff and others have to respect decisions by the hearing officer whether they personally agree with them or not. As a result of everything that has happened in the past year or two, there has been a loss of confidence in and an increase in uncertainty about the whole process. I personally, personally have lost a lot of faith in the vicious and dangerous dog process that I fought so hard to protect. I support increased oversight of ACC, whether it's through this commission or some other mechanism. I think a lot of these questions that have been raised need to be addressed. We need a complete, open, and unemotional discussion of these issues. And that's something this commission actually could just be a forum for discussing um, various issues and, and things like that. Um, had there been a strong mechanism for dealing with, with issues as they came up, uh, some of the things that John has talked about might have been resolved at the time and, and not festered, which just made everything worse. I don't really care who said or did what when, and to be honest, I think people on all sides of this have, have not always behaved um, in the best ways. I care about the dogs and the dog owners in the city, ensuring there's a fair, compassionate, and just system to deal with vicious or aggressive dogs. And so I do hope that there is some way that we can talk about a lot of these issues, whether just picking a few of them out and talking about them, or um, however, uh, any kind of accountability or transparency. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, take one more. Please. In July of 2016, I sat down with the city administrator's <laughs> representative and I outlined the problems that we were having. And to this day, I am still committed to solving this problem, to fixing it and making it better. And I always have. And uh, unfortunately, the last year and a half on the other side has been kill the messenger. And uh, it, it's very hard to get through that. Okay. Is there any further public comment? Seeing none, public comment is closed. Um, I propose um, commissioners uh, to review this um, presentation, and then we can have further discussion next month, it seems. Um, yes? A second there? Yeah, OK. All right, let's 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 do that and review this. In the meantime, and one question I have is that um, I understand Mr. Denny cannot answer is the issue of the grand jury and what is happening there and if, in fact, there is some um, ongoing oversight. Um, I understand and respect that you're unable to speak to that, um, but it might be worth uh, us, the commissioners, um, trying to figure out what, what's happening there. And only for the reason I don't want to do I don't want redundancies right. in this oversight process. I want to understand um, in what way we can be a forum to forum to understand what needs to be changed or what, what we might be able to help with. But um, I don't want to do anything that's already happening right now. Um, and, not, and, and I know you can't comment on that. So it's more of an education for the for commissioners to see where the holes are, where those gaps are, and how we might be able to fill them. I'd be happy to help. I, I know where all the holes are. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Um, okay, so with that, um, we will move on. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Dunning. And again, thank you for your patience um, with our commission um, in getting this uh, presentation to us.